Hey, come on. There you go. Hello, my friends. Hello, my life warriors, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to the Day In, Day Out podcast. Woo! And Happy New Year to one and all. Uh, yes, today on episode 322, I am very lucky to have Matt Larson on the podcast today. Ah, yes, he is a change management uh, specialist uh, with regards to electric mobility. Uh, also an uh, author of six books, uh, nevertheless. Uh, we, he's here to talk about hmm, what the sort of real change of all this electrical, um, how can I say, electric vehicles might cost us um, globally, individually, and who else? Who knows what else? <laughs> Sir, how are you today? I'm fine, thank you. It's a great day to have a podcast. Indeed. The weather is frightful. Uh, best to stay in and <laughs> yeah, to have a nice conversation. Now, with regards to, like, you have been working in, how can I say, the industry of, like, environment, oh, what Oh, no, I am gonna. I'm getting tongue tied. It's been a long break over the Christmas period, but yeah, you've been uh, like working in the industry of like uh, basically change uh, for the last thirty years. Like yeah, yes. With regards to like the change over the last thirty years, it seems like there was nothing going on for a good considerable amount of time. There was like the electric car revolution in the 90s which then just faded out and now it's gone gangbusters crazy why is this well it's it's been a, a long time with a very few people engaging in uh, the, the change and and there are still very few people who are, have a systems per perspective on this um, change process uh, and understand what the amount of resources that will be needed to change all cars in the UK or in the EU uh, and an in increasing share of lorries and buses to electric drive as well. Mm -hmm. And people mostly see it see this change as a change of vehicles like instead of buying a, a petrol car we yeah. buy a, a, an electric car next time but as more people buy electric cars this will increase the demand for electricity uh, it will increase the the demand for uh, grid capacity and charging infrastructure so people will need a charger at home and if they don't have a dedicated park parking spot where they can park their car and charge at night, they need somewhere else where they can charge. And that's not always easy to solve. So it's a system change, not only because we won't be needing uh, petrol stations to the same extent as we do today. We, we won't be needing needing. Um, there will be also be other other industries that will be uh, affected by this change, and we will need to b build up new resources for this uh, on a large scale. So it's a much more complex change than most people have realized, and it's and sustainability experts people who are uh, who politicians who are driving this change and also um, business leaders tend to narrow it down and see and describe it and tackle it as a relatively simple change from one type of vehicle to another but in reality that's not very realistic mm, yeah like this is the thing how can I put it we like uh... The sort of Joe Bloggs public have been sold like the, have the dream of cheaper travel uh, all through the system. It's like, yes, you just charge it overnight. You get that much. It's that much more cheaper. It's not going to be costing. The environmental impact is going to be a lot less. But like from what I understand of it, and I'm not no expert this is just from what i've observed and now cheaper at this present time okay yes it is cheaper 
that there is no doubt about it. But whether it stays cheaper, as you talk about the sort of demands and increase of infrastructure, uh, like there's a, uh, you might know it, Coronation Street uh, soap opera, right? Yes. Every time there's a commercial break for Coronation Street, the demands on the like the infra the national grid spikes because everyone turns on their kettles to get a cup of tea. <laughs> That's just a kettle. It's not. It's not a huge car, uh, like which is like calling on power supplies for eight hours at a time. Uh, so that cost hasn't been taken into account of and the environmental impact let's just say it's a damn sight more simple to like build an engine in whichever country you want it to build in rather than sort of like going over to many a different country overseas gathering all these resources minerals like to build the batteries then ship it to another place then get shipped again so it's a bit. It seems like a false dawn. Am I wrong in saying that? No, it's it's actually um, uh, you're making a number of good points there because mm -hmm. it is a matter of building entirely new systems for building new supply chains for for the material that will be needed for batteries, but also the different components in cars mm -hmm. and a large number of of chargers will be needed probably countries will need electric roads by which um, drivers can charge while going on the road so they they, they there are technologies either for for pantographs and and uh, cables in the air or or mm. tracks in, in the road surface and uh, to to make it possible to charge uh, while driving but it will take more than a decade to build that type of, of infrastructure. And we, there will be need for, for um, battery production, huge amounts of lithium ion mm. uh, material and other, other uh, rare uh, minerals, uh, for example. And these supply chains, they have not been, been de fully developed because the number of electric cars at present is very low in the uk you have five percent electric cars and a lot and a large share of those are hybrids so in order to change the entire car fleet and an increasing share of of the uk um lorry fleet of lorries and buses mm. uh, you will need much larger amounts uh, of of lithium iron and, and other uh precious minerals and there will be a big need for charges, etc. Et so, and no one except myself to a relatively limited extent, I'm, because I've I've written six books about it, and and yeah. uh, but it, it I haven't been able to to dig deep into each one of these issues and and analyze each one, and there has not been very much analysis of any of those or, or most of those. Um, issues from a from a neutral perspective from someone uh, who's not um how should i say oh. who's not a politically uh, pardon? biased i i could yeah. say biased towards a certain um so so there's a, a big need for for a unbiased mapping of all the the resources that will be needed and all the types of activities that will be needed and it, just to, to mention one very telling uh, aspect is that, that to charge all cars in the UK or drive all cars in the UK on electricity uh, for a year, you'd need 100 terawatt hours of electricity. That's 30% of the current power production. So it's not just a kettle put on during Coronation Street. It's, it's, <laughs> it's a huge <laughs> amount of power. And uh, that's the, the, the power generation of of nine nuclear reactors or 30,000 wind turbines. So, and that is is a huge amount of, of electricity. <laughs> and it's only one of the aspects that uh, needs to be, be solved or needs to be taken care of in order to um, to do this change.
Yeah, because like this is the thing. I, I one of the things what sort of okay confuses me. I don't actually see the sort of I can't see the sort of big picture. Why is there such a frantic rush uh, to get it done by? It was twenty thirty, and now it's twenty thirty five. Why? What's brought this frantic rush on? Uh, is there a all of a sudden a like how can a a, sca- a catastrophic failure in the resources, which uh, like for petrol cars, or is it something else? I think it's. Uh, I, th- that's been a call from um, uh, sustainability experts and uh, sustainability activists that more has to be done to to uh, uh, turn the world, turn society sustainable uh, mm. in various ways. But sustain- these sustainability experts have not specified. There are a number of different activities that will be needed to create a sustainable society. And the, the one... The, the one change that has come the farthest in this and the big big uh, large scale change that has has actually made some progress uh, so far is the change to uh, to electromobility and we see that there is an increasing number of uh, electric uh, cars in the streets and and there is a lot of of uh, discussion about electric lorries and buses and so on so so that has been like a um one of the things that politicians have been able to uh, pinpoint and say, oh, this we can do and let's do it quick. And we we can, we can actually achieve this. And the UK government in uh, 2020 um, decided about this 10 point plan of the Boris Johnson um, government that, that included 10 different um, changes and that was when when uh, the, the, as one of those uh, the points they decided to to f- to ban the sales of new fossil fuel cars from 2030 which was now in, uh, in last year changed to uh, uh, 2035 but so so there there were other other uh, points nine other points in this uh, 10 point program as well uh, for example um in, um, installing a number of small nuclear reactors, uh, changing uh, an entire city, I think, to um, to hydrogen uh, fueled uh, systems, and and uh, and so on. But the the one thing that that has been most that that seems most tangible and possible, and which still hasn't been investigated in in detail, is the change to um, electric vehicles. And I think it's it's become one of the type flagship changes for governments to actually show that they are doing something to um, to to change but they haven't realized the complexity of this mm. yeah like with regards to the complexity of it all like let's not even talk about regular everyday cars like basically I've been up and down <clears throat> the UK motorway uh a lot over the christmas period and just seeing the heavy goods vehicles going up and down and you if you're changing that entire fleet over okay now the sort of lead time of basically getting goods from one place to another will have to accommodate yeah a big eight hour stopover where nothing's moving and this could be basically rel- like this could be relatively short because the rain i don't know what the range is like for heavy goods vehicles when like such a large battery pack and everything like that a couple of yeah. hundred miles I, I don't think it's going to be able to do the whole length of the country without stopping 200 miles in or 250 yeah. um the new trucks uh, have um in terms of range but uh, then as you say it also reduces the battery packs reduce the the weight of the load uh, and the, can, that can be taken and the, the space uh, f- that can be used for for um, um for goods and mm. so but it, there is 
a, a big need to um, analyze the um, um, the routes and and how. Uh, heavy vehicles are used because many heavy vehicles are used for for um, long haul routes uh, overnight, and mm -hmm. then they are used for um, first and last mile deliveries uh, over, during the day, and they have very short uh, short spaces in time. Uh, in the morning and in, in the evening and during lunch when they can be charged. And in order to charge a lot of vehicles very rapidly, heavy vehicles very rapidly uh, during those short windows, um, it, a lot of electricity will be needed. And, uh, you know, Volvo truck, the um, one of the biggest companies in the world, yeah. Uh, in in the truck industry, they also own uh, Renault truck, Nissan truck, a Mack truck in the U.S. Um, uh, so uh, the the CEO of Volvo Truck, he said that in order to charge 1,000 heavy trucks at the same time, fast charge them. For example, in the morning when when a lot of trucks will will stand still and and uh, load reload, and th there will be a need. Perhaps for for almost the uh, um, the capacity of an entire nuclear reactor, just for one thousand uh, heavy trucks that to be charged at uh, in parallel. So if you have like in Sweden we have eighty five thousand trucks. We're ten million people. If you have say six times that that amount, you you may have several thousand trucks in the UK that maybe may have to be charged uh, over this short period of time in the morning, in the evening, and during lunch, and sometimes at, at night. <laughs> and that would, would mean a very big um, uh, amount of capacity at those very moment, moments. Mm. Yeah, because this is the thing. Like, when you say capacity, um, it seems like, okay, if we kind of look at most of Europe uh, over the last few years, because of the switch over from coal like to like more cleaner uh, like energy well energy supplies the capacity has gone down across the board everywhere and with regards to is it size well C the new like nuclear power station they're building over here in the UK that doesn't come online for I think another five years or so uh, but it's nowhere going to match the needs of what you're just talking about. That's just to help cover the sort of loss of the coal power stations and give it a little bit more of a kick. It seems like we needed to, well, started to build five, five or 10 years ago, another three of these power stations to accommodate the sort of future demand if it goes away, if it carries down this path. Yes, uh, and uh, transportation is not the only uh, area where there will be a need for more power. Mm. Uh, a lot of interest is um, turned to towards uh, hydrogen as a fuel uh, for for transportation, but also for industrial purposes. We are uh, in Sweden. There are two big uh, conversions of of steel uh, plants in the north. Uh, that that um, uh, are going to turn sustainable by by using hydrogen instead of, instead of coal fueled processes and the uh, hydrogen production is really uh, energy intensive and it's the, that energy has to come from electricity and it, it's the process of electrolysis and you to 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 separate, for example, in water, the oxygen from the hydrogen, and you get hydrogen that you can use for as a fuel. And yeah. in order to do that, if we would fuel our entire car fleets uh, uh, by, uh, with hydrogen, I, I mentioned 100 terawatt hours for the UK, you will need twice as much, you would need twice as much uh, electricity to produce the hydrogen if you'd fuel the entire uh, UK car fleet uh, using hydrogen so you'd need 200 terawatt hours in that case and and the plan there are plans in sweden we we have relatively small vehicle fleets mm -hmm. um say four four million cars and uh, 4.5 million cars but we have um a big 
big in industrial needs changing from natural gas to electricity changing from from uh, coal fired steel production to uh, to hydrogen so we estimate or the government and other other um, expert organizations have estimated that we will need to double uh, power generation uh, until 2050 which is a, a much bigger in the uk a doubling would mean 325 terawatt hours uh, we have in sweden we have we actually have three times more uh, electricity at present compared to the uk per person so um, so uh, because of we have uh, hydroelectric power and we we use very little um, gas here natural gas mm. uh, so so uh, but it, overall uh, there is uh, th there is probably a need to double uh, or the the uh, power generation in many countries in order to facilitate not only uh, the change of transportation to electric vehicles, but also increasing use of hydrogen as a fuel, the increasing um, um, electrification of other areas to reduce the use of, of natural gas and so on. Mm. Because like this is the thing, with, uh, with the cost of just basically getting hydrogen, uh, that is very expensive. But one of the, the thing what always, I remember watching the documentary about the space show, uh, the last flight, and they go every time they fire off hydrogen rockets, about 15, 20 minutes after it launches, it rains. And that if you've all of a sudden now got a car fleet going around, which is just using hydrogen, like no one actually knows what the possible effects might be on a local area. Will it all of a sudden increase the chances of rain? Oh, like, will it, like, like, we're currently experiencing some floods here in the UK. Will it, like, add to that even more? Or what would the impacts be? No one knows, you know? Mm. Well, I, no, I, I don't know. I, uh, and I think many of these aspects, not only the, the different uh, activities and the different resources that need to be built up, but mm. also the, um, the different consequences of of changing in this way uh, will um, ha have been insufficiently uh, analyzed. Uh, I've uh, actually finished a book, uh, a new book, uh, right last week. Okay. Uh, that's about the uh, uh, economic and social consequences of the rapid change to um, electric vehicles. So um, th th there are a lot of of like if you ban the sales of petrol and diesel cars, you will inevitably uh, make a lot of people unemployed because they make those cars. Mm. And that's a huge number of people in in uh, the EU and the UK. You have 700,000 people, in, uh, employees in the uh, um, car industry, auto industry in the UK. Mm. There are 13 million uh, people in uh, the EU uh, that are employed in um, in uh, the automotive industry, and you will inev inevitably make many of those uh, unemployed if you ban the sales of of petrol and diesel cars uh, from a certain date. And if there are no plans for the um, uh, for for the expansion of the the systems uh, of power generation power grids and so on that will make it increase the certainty or increase the probability uh, that um, uh, people will get new new jobs and if you don't have training programs to 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 train them for the new ro types of roles and new types of industries that, that they will need to work then there will be consequences that are very very concrete in, in terms of uh, that will affect the the livelihoods of people yeah but like, yeah it just it feels like and i don't like saying it feels like but that's what it seems like to me it feels like they've done this all out of a whim they went you know what electric cars by 2030 and i like, went okay let's do it and it seems like collectively the whole world like got on board with it and then someone went someone stood up who was like, 
we might not be able to do it by 2030. Uh, and they went pandemic or something else has pushed the, back the timetable and they went, everyone, okay, 2035. Yes. And that's all they've said with no rhyme or reason. Yes. I've, I've uh, explored this since 2006, um, and I've written six books. The first one uh, in 2009, and I've all this time tried to find the people who are, who have, other people who have taken this uh, system system perspective on the change and tried to understand the the the, uh, the system needs, mm. uh, but I haven't found. Any, it's it's fair to say, I, I, it's probably not right to say that I haven't found any, but I have found very few persons who have uh, taken this uh, system perspective, uh, this broad uh, overview of of the um, resources needed and the consequences, and try to do something similar to myself. And I'm. The, the one the only one who has written books uh, and reports about it and and now i've started to um, make uh, youtube videos and and um, to communicate these different aspects in, in a series of videos and so on so um, but but even though i've i've tried and i've i've been around uh, visiting uh, conferences mm -hmm. um in in about the uh, technology management and, and technology change i've i've written six books and and tried to find people to collaborate with uh, around those books and i've i've done a lot of things to to try to and, and i've in interviewed um people in in all the the um, relevant industries like uh, the automotive industry, utilities, transportation, um, government, and so on. Uh, but I have found very few that have been interested in have and that have been interested in, in developing their knowledge about these uh, very important aspects. Why do you think there's such like a lack of interest in trying to pick this up? Because it's going to be hugely important over the next 30 40 well frig it's going to be the next important like major important thing going forward from to god knows when you know well i i think it's what one of the, the things is that people are busy and they have already have jobs mm. and so they have uh 35 or 40 hour a week or some have may have 50 60 hour weeks uh at their regular job uh and they don't they may think that oh this is this is interesting it's important but i can't stop doing my my job just because uh a new issue um appears at the horizon mm. so they they continue with what they are, are already do and what they're already good at uh, but then there's also the uh, the feeling that this is such a huge issue that, that there are so many different aspects and components to it uh, you you need to understand a little about uh, transportation and vehicles uh, lorries buses cars you need to understand utilities and and the uh, power generation you, you you need to be um, aware of well uh, what what a terawatt hour is and how much energy does a nuclear reactor p produce and how if you have if you want 100 terawatt hours how many wind turbines do you need and can, can do we have do we need battery uh, battery storage of electricity um a lot of those different aspects that i have been exploring for 18 years now uh, people f feel that that oh i couldn't build up this competence i couldn't uh, become well versed in all those areas so um, i think that's a, a reason as well that that uh, people there's a need for for someone to finance the competence building and the the um, the building of resources for this because people will not do that in their spare time. 
Hmm. Okay. Yeah, because it like for myself looking at it, and I I am by all means no expert in this whatsoever, but it seems to be quite simple back of the napkin maths. If we produce X amount of electricity for the country or like for let's just say society as a whole, how like can we run or switch over to this many like the whole car fleet to this amount of electric cars? Yes or no? And the answer is quite clearly coming out no. And if you wanted to turn that to a yes, it's about increasing capacity and how you what you decide to increase that capacity with that is that is the sixty four thousand dollar question like if you go with traditional old dirty means of coal or like yeah new methods like wind solar like sea power or <clears throat> the, the one thing no one really wants to talk about <laughs> nuclear power <laughs> it's like yes yeah yes absolutely like, it's like yeah why like it doesn't feel like anyone's done that type of maths if you go know i mean if they have well, they would be building right now wouldn't they yes th there is but there's also been a tendency uh to as you've already touched upon to to simplify things and and to um to to uh, to uh, convey this as if it were really uh, unproblematic change and something that that people would not need to worry about, mm. um, because uh, the the sustainability experts have have made those promises um, back in the day when they started this this debate that or. At least they haven't highlighted the, the need for investments and uh, the need for sacrifices in various ways uh, so, or cost increases. So um, I think most uh, definitely politicians and, and business leaders have been um, cautious to to raise the alarm or, or um, say that uh, raise questions that are actually that could actually make them seem less positive or or not not so um uh, well as someone who's not in favor of this change give them a like give them a sort of way into like oh no 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 we shouldn't change at all because like one of the things you just said like sacrifices now there is there has to be some form of sacrifice which comes in in either the realm of money to build all this new infrastructure or basically giving it up a lot of like regular constant supply of electricity which is a huge impact on any country which has a, a irregular energy supply uh which that seems like that will be one of the huge steps, it looks like it would go down. If you're not building anything new to bring in new supply, then everyone has to use a lot less. And I can only see that in the realm of everyone stops using their electrical products. Like I say this ironically, uh, talking to you over the internet, uh, using my computer, <laughs> <laughs> microphone all supplied with electricity, or it's a case of, yeah, that rolling blackouts will come into play and just to sort of keep this sustainable future going. Yes, there is also the aspect of of um uh well political aspect that um the idea that the market tends to solve these uh types of issues and they t tend to create uh new industries in a much more efficient way than uh, um mm. human deci decision making could uh and then but people 
uh, tend to uh, tend not to be aware of this how technologies have been developed in the past and the role of of government financing in past technology developments. Um, there, for example, the um, Apollo program that started the, the development of space technologies, the, the role of military investments and, and research if, for airplane technologies that is now that have has have now contributed to making um uh, air travel uh, much less expensive uh, the the development of of the internet and the, the development of computers after the the second world war where that was totally driven by uh, or to a very large extent driven by government investments uh, and the investment in in uh, Power, power production, power grids. Back in uh, the nineteenth century, um, the the car, uh, the car industry seems to be a an exception from that rule. But when we realize that the 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 big development of car ownership and car, uh, and the use of cars started after the well after. Um, armies started to uh, become motorized mm. and and they demanded bigger numbers of cars and trucks and uh, uh, that were easy to maintain and that were all in the same uh, of a, a similar model uh, that had to be uh, produced in a in a very efficient manner and of course in combination with the uh, moving assembly line by uh, developed by Henry Ford but in all those developments, we've seen uh, that that uh, government investments have, for a, for a number of decades, been very critical to the development of the first generations of these technologies. And now governments are, are saying that we don't need to to make any big big investments. We just need to uh, uh, we we just need to ban the sales of new petrol and diesel cars from 2035, and and then the market will solve the rest. It's never been like that, or it, it, in very rare occasions it has been that perhaps been like that. But in most of the technology development examples I've mentioned, and many more, uh, government investment has made played a very important role to, over the a number of decades. Mm. Yeah. So do you, with regards to the sort of lack of government intervention with regards to investment to build this new infrastructure or like to put huge swathes of investment into like the next sort of generation of like electric vehicles or well, you could say green technologies. Like, do you think like does it look to you as a professional that the government is, how can I be, uh, that negligent or just they're passing it on to someone else because it's not their problem? Uh, well, I, I need to emphasize also uh, that uh, Government investment doesn't mean a large scale nationalization of of industries and and a large scale bu uh, building of of mm. a government controlled the uh, automotive industry oh, and the government controlled oh. utilities industry uh, because that hasn't been the case earlier either but it requires a a, a big uh, expansion or uh, an increase in the the, the no knowledge about these things at government agencies and i think that's the government ha or and politicians haven't realized how this should be done and how it has been done in the past because if we look at at uh, the space development nasa played a, a critical role in coordinating all the activities and all the investments that made possible the development of private companies uh, flourishing in the uh, uh, space industry, and the the organization ARPA, uh, the agency of well, the, it's American uh, agency of very advanced uh, development projects, yeah. developed the um, the um, 
uh, the ARPANET, which was the pre precursor of the uh, internet. So it's not a matter of of uh, of the government becoming a, a big um, or it's a matter of of organizing and and coordinating development activities not a matter of of nationalizing uh large parts of of uh, big industries mm, no i agree nationalization uh, never really works i'm like talking about in the respects of uh, if i from my memory back uh, to back like in the 70s uh, when rolls royce uh, came up with i believe it was the trent uh, jet engine and like rolls royce was literally literally on the cusp of bankruptcy and the government of the time went oh that's a very good idea here like here's a pool of money keep the good work up and away they went and it is um i think it's it's either one or two like the most popular jet engine next to ge's like mm -hmm. jet engine and but uh, with regards to when we like sort of touched on nuclear reactors, Rolls Royce has developed a portable nuclear reactor, which uh, is like which can be deployed pretty much anywhere you need it to be. Which I think is going to be one of the main factors for helping us like do this greener future. If it does, like if. People, if you don't believe nuclear power is not going to be involved in this future, you're wrong. <laughs> it's coming. Uh, so, yeah, uh, we've, they've developed and made it themselves, but it doesn't seem like they, I could be wrong about this, but it doesn't seem like they've had that much sort of government funding or anything like that. It's kind of like, oh, yeah, do your thing. But that sort of funding, which maybe could kick it on, like speed things up maybe by 10 years, 20 years, isn't, doesn't seem like it's coming, you know? No, no, absolutely. Uh, it's in when industries start to mature and when te technologies start to mature, the, the need for government funding goes down dramatically. And, and that's why it was, it was possible in the 1970s in the UK to to privatize a um, lot of industries that had been built up using uh, uh, well become nationalized or uh, or public in in the public domain uh, because in many areas but, but we sh we shouldn't perhaps use the model that had create which shouldn't use the models that had created the nationalized industries in the first place but we, we need to and um, governments need to build up the competence to to drive these developments and coordinate development activities and understand what part of these activities that can be financed and undertaken by by uh, the markets and what parts need some type of support and how they need to organize this support to make make uh, the investments and the expansion happen because it's very diff different to change three big industries like the automotive uh, the um, the utilities industries the, the industry that needs to expand dramatically and the transportation industry over only a period of 10 or 12 or 15 years uh, to electric uh, it's very diff different to do that compared to allowing a number of industries develop at their own pace over half a century or or a century or perhaps more in some cases. So so compressing the time needed for 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 this uh, transformation increases or creates a need for coordination and and. Um, some management of the process but not financing of the entire um development oh, i see yeah no i hear you i hear you. but let's let's hope they get their act together <laughs> <laughs> yeah. with regards to your no, author side yeah how to build uh, the future really works 
How long have you been working on this book uh, to get out there? It depends on uh, how you see it. Uh, it's the, the, this book, How Building the Future Really Works, is a, a summary and an update of the other books I've written. So I started to write the, the first book, Global Energy Transformation, um, published in 2009. I started to write that in 2007. Mm. So basically, you could say that I've been working on this book since 2006 or 2007. It's only, But it only took me uh, four months or so to write the actual book because I had so much material. I had to um, update uh, few things and and uh, well get uh, recent figures uh, from the the past but but I had built up all that material as well so um, I I'd worked on on the ideas and the concepts in the book uh, for 15 years or so but mm. it only took a few months to write write the actual text and I had written a number of academic books before like global energy transformation the business of global energy transformation were both published by um, the academic publisher uh, palgrave and so was the the circular business models uh, which was another of the previous books uh, so i had a lot of a lot of material from those Excellent. Excellent. And if someone was to read this book, what would be like a couple of the key insights they were getting from this? Yeah, the main message is that um, technology development and the large scale implementation of new technologies is, has, is much more complex process uh, than most people realize. And that that Government investments have been a key aspect of many of the developments of the past, and that in order to change rapidly to um, electromobility or to uh, uh, a circular economy or or any of those large scale changes, where we actually also have in place very efficient present systems, incumbent systems within in, uh, incumbent companies that need to find new, uh, new, develop new business areas and, and new business processes and, and business models. And in order to th do this over a very short space of time, there will be a need for, for um, um, coordination and large scale financing from uh, governments because the market can't do all these things. The only thing that the market does uh, is to to set a, an equilibrium price mm. on something. And that's only possible in, in perfect markets, which is a, is a theoretical con construct. So the market doesn't create automatically an efficient uh, new transportation or an efficient new auto industry in 15 years just because uh, politicians have decided to ban the sales of new petrol and diesel vehicles from 2035 so so that's the the main the gist of the argument that these pro uh, these this change needs to be uh, tightly managed and more people need to understand how 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 to go about changing on a large scale mm -hmm. No, indeed they do. And like with regards to the realm of change, uh, like the sort of cooperation, I think uh, with regards to that sort of cooperation, uh, globally it would be kind of unprecedented because there is, because of the way you, the global economy works, it is everywhere. It's you need a, a one sort of clear, concise way of doing things, which will be a long-term plan. And I'm saying this in the sort of context of uh, a certain country, I don't know, uh, might be number one, is having an election this year and how policies can shift so extremely in that country. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, let's just say, and yeah, the EU is kind of fracturing with the sort of like, it doesn't seem to have one sort of clear like line as it used to 
So it's that's going to make things tricky as well. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yes. I have to ask, this will be my final question before I let you go off and enjoy your weekend of fun and games in the, in the snow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What would you like, like, what would you like to achieve in the next, well, in this year, as it's the new year, what would you like to achieve? <laughs> yeah, that's a very good question. And thank you very much for asking. Uh, it's, um, I'd like to, get i'd like to get governments to start to organize this change and to to map the 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 different activities and develop realistic um time plans for the various aspects of the change mm. and set the change on a realistic uh, uh, time plan uh, overall uh, and I realize that's a, a very big um, wish and it's, but I'd like to, there aren't many jobs at present for people like myself who are uh, electrification strategists or um, pe more technically minded people who are electrification architects that people with the, the intent and the competence to, to structure the systems. So there will be a need for, for many uh, electrification strategists uh, and architects in various roles around society at top level, uh, in top level positions in, in national um, government agencies, at, at positions in regional uh, agencies, at companies and, and in uh, local governments that structure that, that help contribute to structure the the various systems that will be needed for electromobility to become both cost effective and uh, user friendly. So so my wish uh, is for governments to start to realize this and for this type of position to be become created in more places. Uh, so that we can we can get to work developing uh, the systems and the and blueprints for the various types of systems uh, that will will be needed. Awesome, awesome. Ah, Matt, pleasure to have you on the show today. Thank you for coming on. Can you tell the lovely people out there how they can find you out in this big wide world? <laughs> yes, uh, I'd very much like people to contact me uh, my email address is matt at getinstitute.com matt at getinstitute.com i have a website www.getinstitute.com uh, and you can also find my uh, youtube channel with my videos uh uh, under the name of matt larson uh, on on youtube and uh, it's getting increasingly the, the material there is getting increasingly prolific so um, I'm I'm posting a video every week now ah brilliant brilliant ah Matt thank you for coming on today it's been a delight it's been a pleasure uh, to say the least thank you very much as well thank you no worries no worries at all I'd like to say thank you to you my friends my life warriors for coming on well sticking with us all the way to the end of the show. So yeah, let me just say this, subscribe, like, and all of that bit. I, I never really say this, but it's 2024, it's a new year. But let me just say this to you, please stay well, stay safe, be awesome, be excellent, be fantastic, be all the positive bees you can be in this world, and then some. Have a great day, my friends, my life warriors. Peace. Oh, <laughs> and we are...